a track and field champion, a diplomat, a government senator, an ambassador to the court of St. James, a professor of international relations, a minister of foreign affairs. This is Basil Itz. I grew up in Belmont. I was born in Port of Spain. I was told I was born in Queen Street. And then uh, I we moved to Belmont. I grew up with my mom and my aunt. Uh, my father worked at the Guardian for many years, many, many years. He was editor of the Guardian and, uh, and, until, until he retired. And from him, I think the drive I think I could, the, whatever uh, little I've done in my life, I think the drive came from him. My aunt was a teacher. She taught for many years, and I think uh, she was the one who was, I would say, primarily responsible for my education. What my aunt did, I wasn't doing as well as I should in school. I said, listen, you've got to go with your godfather because exhibition was coming up, exhibition time. My godfather was a, a gentleman called Noel Sam. Because of him, I managed to do well in exhibition. I went to Queen's Royal College, and I think from there, my life took off. At first, the young Basil did not take to track and field, but by his fifth year at QRC, he was breaking records. I came on, a, on a QRC Sports Day. That was my last year there. And I won from the 100 meters or the 100 yards right up to the mile. That was in 1952, and his success at QRC Sports brought him to the attention of a visiting athletic coach, Ding Dosault, who was attached to Tufts University, Boston, Massachusetts. Dosault was sufficiently impressed, and Ince went to Tufts in 1956 and began running for the university. In 1959, he became the first trackman ever to win the Most Valuable Player Award at Tufts. At Tufts, I did my undergraduate work in history and political science. Uh, it was tough during those years. I was going to school, studying, running track, traveling, running track uh, on weekends. Sometimes it'd be meet during the week. Uh, but I studied. I remember uh, going to Madison Square Garden, running indoors, and studying, with, having my books there uh, for studying for an exam. Then. Uh, after Tufts, I graduated from Tufts, and I said, what will I do now? And I did a master's in political science. I did a, a PhD in political science, concentrating in things like international relations, international law, comparative politics. And then I did also on the side American diplomatic history. And at that point, when I have just before, I, I didn't graduate then, but I had finished all my coursework. As you know, in the American system, you do a lot of graduate uh, work, a lot of uh, courses. And at the end of my course, and the, the pass of my exams, I had to write my thesis. And while I was doing that, I was called to work in the Fair and Tobago Diplomatic Service, where I spent two years at the UN. Uh, at that point, uh, Sir Ellis Clark was a diplomat then. He was uh, in charge in Washington and in New York. So I worked there for two years, and then I came back to Trinidad at the headquarters, then I went back up there, and uh, at that time I decided to leave the, the, the diplomatic service. That's why I wanted to teach. I got to know Dr. Ince at the Institute of International Relations at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. He was my lecturer. I did the Diploma in International Relations. I then went on to do the master's degree in international relations. And after the master's, Dr. Ince had by then become the director of the Institute of International Relations. And while I was finishing off my thesis and so, he needed a research assistant and I was recruited to do that work with him. He was very effective as a lecturer because he was able to break down very complex issues taking place at the international level so that we could grasp their significance for Trinidad and Tobago and for the other countries of the Caribbean. He was a very prolific writer 
Um, right, he wrote extensively about the foreign policies of the different countries of the Caribbean. Dr. Ince at one time, after he left the Institute of International Relations, he became foreign minister of this country. On the only occasion that the government of Trinidad and Tobago served on the Security Council of the United Nations, that was done because of his acute thinking and seizing a moment or an opportunity to get us on the Security Council. One of the points that we advanced why we should be on the Security Council was that we had made a contribution to the United Nations in a variety of ways. We had served on various committees, but we had not served on the, on the highest body, namely the Security Council. In addition, we also thought that we had a particular perspective to bring, a perspective of a, of a Caribbean state, uh, the perspective of a state that had a, uh, whose region had seen uh, an intervention or violence the year before. And as such, we were really sensitized to the whole issue of peace and security ever more than ever. When he first took the decision, I don't even believe he consulted with his prime minister. I believe he saw the opportunity. We were at the UN, we took the decision, and subsequently it was ratified by the government. It's the only time that the country has ever served in the Security Council. It was due to his own initiative and quick thinking. As a minister, he performed, he sought to understand the job and to really come to grips with the issues. I don't believe that he spent sufficiently long as a politician to really have the kind of image of the politician that one normally sees or hears about. When I was in Parliament, the opposition members used to refer to the, to the senators as, a, as people who came in by the back door uh, in, in, in disparaging terms. They didn't know it. But I was proud to have come to the back door because I didn't want to be an elected person. I always felt it was a compliment coming through the back door, it was, it was a sense was letting them know I am not an elected person and was never to be uh, one feeling to be in active politics as such. Uh, so I don't, I don't think I had, the, had the, the, the guts or the power urge to be in that sort of politics. The transition from diplomacy to politics is perhaps a difficult one. Uh, Maybe he didn't stay long enough in politics to have matured in that era. I stayed in external affairs, and then elections were coming around, coming up, and I did not want to run. And I'm going to go back with this now, uh, my, my aversion to politics, but uh, my aversion to politics in the sense of running for a seat. I, when I was teaching at, at the Institute, I, was, uh, I went to a conference in Puerto Rico, uh, an academic conference, and all of a sudden came over the uh, air, Dr. Ince, would someone call Dr. Ince? And I went. It was a call from Privat, uh, who was then, of course, a minister in the government uh, with, uh, with Williams, and he, Williams had died, died then. And he said, uh, uh, we would like you to run for Southwest Polar Swing Seat. And I said, <laughs> I said, no, thank you. Because I didn't want to be in that, that sort of politics. And then uh, I came back. And so I'm, that's just the backdrop to elections coming again. And Mr. Chambers indicated that, well, I should be running. I said, well, I don't think I want to run. I don't want to be in active politics as such. And then, at that point, uh, I was moved. He moved me for a little while to the Ministry of Sport, because, of course, of my background in sport, prior to going to, uh, to London as High Commissioner, with the elections coming up. And the elections, when the, uh, the PNM was swept out the age of three, I was in London then. 
when I met Vasil, he had been, um, he was in graduate school. I was also a student and, and those were good times. We've been married for about um, 48 years. It's been quite a trip. And um, I would say for the most part, a fairly good trip. We are fairly even-tempered people. I think Basil is much more even-tempered than I am. Basil is a, really a wonderful person. I don't tell him this as often as I should. Basil Ince never ran at the Olympic Games. He won a silver medal in the 400-meter event at the 1959 Pan Am Games as part of the team representing the British West Indies. I read in the newspapers this guy from Trinidad. He, in 70, he went to the Carwell Games. I saw 10-3, uh, 10-3, 10-3. Ten three or something like that, whatever he was running, consistently. And this is Crawford, is it? Crawford, who's this fella? See, this fella is good. And he finished, ended up getting the, the bronze there. Because and only Don Quarry beat him. The fellas who beat him were Olympians, Don Quarry and Lennox Miller, both Olympians, Jamaican Olympians. So I said, this fella must be good. Ince was appointed manager of the Trinidad and Tobago track team for the Montreal Olympics in 1976 when Hazley Crawford won this country's first and only Olympic gold medal. You couldn't believe where they are. Crawford, we Crawford. Then they say they never see that yet. It's time to finish, moving like a jet. Lake Quad, champion, Montreal, gold medal. Hazley is winning the gold medal meant so much to me. It meant a lot to me. Not, of course it meant a lot to Trey and Tobago, naturally. It meant a lot to Hazley too, as an athlete. But it meant a lot to me because in a sense, vicariously, I had seen myself doing well at the Olympic Games when I had gone, and I hadn't even gone to the Games. And I saw, in a sense, live vicariously through Hazley when he won the gold medal, so I felt good about that. Basil Ince has written a book documenting the involvement of Trinidad and Tobago athletes at the Olympics from 1948 to 2004. This is the book. And I had been working on that, this, 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 this book. But what happened when I had all this information, all this data, I say, there's no book on and the Olympics were coming up. I said, there, there's no book on the Olympics. So I just grabbed out some stuff I had in it, everything and did this book quickly, and that's how that book came about. And how does the diplomat politician view the antics of today's parliamentarians? Parliament is always testy, there's that give and take, but I think the give and take now is harsher. It's harsher and uh, uh, almost, I mean, a, a bit too adversarial for my liking. Uh, and I wish they could get a little bit more done and less, uh, hope a little, uh, there's some more light and less heat in, in Parliament. I'm not as uh, swift as I was before, but I, athletics have been a part of my career and I've continued all the time. Basil Ince, I would like to say, is in the autumn of his life. <laughs> in, in the autumn, uh, one has to be practical. Uh, we are given three score, scores and ten. Three score and ten, and uh, I have passed that. I'm taking one day at a time. I'm in retirement and I'm writing and I like that. Basil Ince, man of perpetual motion. Down the track towards the finish line. On the world stage, representing his country, writing, teaching, and sharing himself with others a sterling son of the soil, an inspiration to us all.